is not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Back on the podcast for the first time in a really like in a very long time, in a surprisingly long time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most hated men in the history of wrestling commentary, Josh Matthews. Josh, welcome. You know, I almost was going to say like, oh, I don't know why people hate, but I, I get it. I, I know why they hate me. It's, 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 it's no big deal at this point. So when you went through that period where you were embracing the fact that people hated you, uh, what was that like for you? Because I, I felt like, you know, you were you went through the whole thing of first just calling yourself the number one commentator of all time and like <laughs> throwing other commentators under the bus. And I read it and I was like, oh, Josh, at first I was like, Josh is screwing around. And then I was like, oh, clearly Josh is doing a storyline. But there's something about you that people online were like, no, this is the real Josh Matthews. <laughs> and I really hate this guy. Well, I think it was there was so many there was a combination of so many different things, right? Like like e emotionally, you know, if we're being like honest at this point, I think I can be honest at this point. Like, you know, I was upset that I had didn't have my home any longer after being there for over a decade and, and didn't really know how to uh, go through those emotions. So my initial reaction was, well, I'm the best and, and what a huge mistake and, and all of that. And then it became a storyline, right? And we went through the match and Slammiversary. And, and now I think looking back, like it's, it's probably not the way I, I would have handled it now. Um, but I feel like I had to go through all of that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in such a different place than when I first started with Impact um, and my relationship with WWE ended. You know, I'm so happy with, with where I am in life right now that, you know, looking back, okay, I probably shouldn't have said I was the greatest wrestling announcer of all time. <laughs> like I probably shouldn't have been so defiant about the way I felt about that. Um, you know, it, it, I don't think embarrassed is the right word, but I think I would have handled it much differently had I known, Hey man, in, in a few years, like you're going to meet the love of your life and, and you're going to have a great family and you're going to have all these things that uh, you didn't even know existed before um, and, and have my life changed so much. And I also feel like the rule of thumb is in wrestling, if it becomes a storyline that people buy into, it's all worth it in the end. Like the fact that the whole thing became a storyline means that, you know, can you really regret doing it if it turned into something that made money for the company eventually? Do you know what I mean? Well, I hated it at times, and at times I really liked it. So it was such a catch-22, like the fact that I got to have a match on a pay-per-view and, and do a swanton bomb in India. Uh -huh. um, I mean, those things were fun, and, and looking back, like I'll always remember those and, and, and having to have a match that people liked and, and thought was fun. But the the Twitter stuff and the back and forth and the and the – and the being so outlandish, you know, some of those times were like a little hard and thinking like, eh, I don't know if this is like the right thing. And having conversations, you know, with people who I considered like mentors in this business, you know, like people like Taz, who, who at the time was like, look, man, at any time you can say this is all storyline. I don't really feel, you know what I mean? Like and get yourself out of it um, if you feel it's going too far. So always keep that in mind. But, um, you know, I think at the end, everything worked out the way it should have. And, and you know, it, I, 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 I'm trying to become that trusted voice that I didn't know I needed to be um, in order to be the, the, the straight play by play announcer. Uh, so I'm hoping to that, that that's sort of coming back in this year in uh, 2018. Yeah, I feel like and you know, and we we hung out a little bit when you guys were in town for Bound for Glory, and I definitely feel like you're a, a f you're in such a better place than you were when you first left WWE and, and went over to Impact Wrestling and everything. And I think that that's kind of natural, right? Like, I think that the fact that you were in WWE from the time that you were basically a kid, like, you didn't mature as an adult before you got to WWE, so that was really all you knew of adult working life, and then it's going to take a couple years when you leave something like that to figure out even who you are. And is that right? Yeah, it is. And it, the funny thing is, is how much I took for granted or didn't really appreciate the work that was done 
and had been paved to, hey, we're going to have a pay-per-view in Chicago and have that thing sell out in, in a day. It's just, you know, we went on sale for homecoming on Monday and I get an email every time a ticket gets sold and I get so excited and, and trying to fill that building. Um, but but to do everything, to to give everything of yourself to try to get people there, to try to help something grow, you know, I, for how many years that I walk into a building and, okay, we're sold out. How many, how many tens of thousands of people are in this building? And you don't truly appreciate it unless you're doing the actual work. But I want to go back and, and, and thank Vince McMahon for, for doing what he did. And I can't imagine how many hours uh, and, and time he gave up to, to build the empire that he's built. And then now to be on, uh, in another company to try to do anywhere close to that from marketing efforts to entertainment to, to everything that we're doing. It's just, um, you know, it's work. It's work 24 hours a day. And, and uh, to be able to get up every morning and be motivated to do it is uh, it's fulfilling at the end of the day. It's also tiring. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lot different from just going and broadcasting. And I don't know if people really have a full grasp on what you do over at Impact Wrestling. But, I mean, what's your official title? Because you're doing, and I watched you, you're doing pretty much everything from not only wrangling talent, but wrangling talent and then also directing them. And also, by the way, writing and also uh, figuring out what the slogan's going to be with the network and getting on the phone with the network. And this is all happening all at the same time. I, I watched you as you juggled every responsibility that I could imagine being on the outside looking in. Uh, what's your title and what are some of the responsibilities that you're now filling at Impact Wrestling that people might not realize that you're at least a part of? I think my official title, I'd have to look at my contract, but I think it's VP of uh, digital content, mm -hmm. which when, when I signed that deal, like that's really all I was doing, but it was like every digital platform. So it was Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, handling all of them. And then as the company's grown, thankfully with the, you know, with Anthem coming in, other people have come in and taken over some of those um, roles. So, so I sort of morphed into um, marketing. And so the only department that I don't touch is creative. Um, but Sanjay Dutt, who is the creative director um, and works with a great creative team with Scott and Don and, and Jimmy Jacobs, um, uh, Sanjay and I talk roughly 400 times a day. <laughs> and so they, after they get done, meeting creatively he and i will talk about okay what's our marketing hook for every possible angle on the show and i i work with graphics and our graphics designer is in the uk uh so he's five hours ahead right now until no four hours as we moved our class um so so my day starts at about 4 a.m uh with him going through graphics uh going through different things because that's he's getting his day started at nine um and then with kevin sullivan who's our vice president of production you know, the three of us will talk and go through things. Um, so that's one aspect of it. It's really, you know, what, what, and I think we have the best graphics in wrestling. I think that when you look at like, um, compared to you know, not burying anybody, everyone works hard. Right. But like compared to ring of honors graphics or even WWE, I think we have the most compelling graphics, um, you know, for, for promoting matches and things like that. Um, marketing for the pay-per-views and for the shows and yes, talking to the network. And it's just, during the course of the day, like sometimes I forget like what I'm doing. It's like, okay, wait a second. I just worked on this new t-shirt, but now I have to have a conversation about what our VIP is going to look like for homecoming. Okay. Now I need to go talk to, oh, I, I need to do voiceovers by noon for the show. So it's like, um, a very, uh, organized chaos. Um, but I don't think I, Sam, I don't think I have it any other way because like, I don't think I can just do one thing. Right. Yeah. Like, I think that was kind of the thing in WWE too. It's like, Okay, you're the announcer or you're the interviewer. The backstage interviewer has got to be the worst job in the world because you sit around all day to hold a microphone to say what are your thoughts mm -hmm. and then blankly stare off after they walk away. Um, that's the role there, right? Um, and that kind of gets boring. And then, um, you know, if you're uh, doing the shows, then you're busy all day. But then you get home and, you know, idle time. And idle time is not good for someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I can, you know, I can attest just, to that. Uh, that... It, totally not. But I mean, I, I wake up every day and I grab my laptop and, you know, sometimes I'll my wife will pop in the room and she'll be like, hey, it, it's like one o'clock. You haven't eaten like you got to like stop now for a little bit and then come have lunch and, and do some stuff. So it's just uh, it's just fun sometimes. Do you, are you surprised when you look now that? Not, well, actually, first of all, 
when you talk about all those responsibilities and going over every graphic with the person in the UK and then going over every T-shirt and going over all this stuff, do you think that your time in the WWE gave you a a detail-oriented mentality? Meaning that, like you said, like when you were in WWE, you weren't doing it, but you certainly observed the fact that WWE as a company pays attention to every last detail of every little thing. When you now are given responsibilities and impact, do you feel like those lessons that you didn't even know you were being taught kind of rub off on you as you realize every single thing that you put out is important? 100%. Yeah. And and just being on the plane with them or being in meetings with them and seeing the way they worked. And I learned so much from Kevin Dunn that, you know, my wife is in the room right now, but when it comes to work, like the answer is always yes. Like you always say yes to work and you'll figure everything else out as you go along. And that's always my take. And she, you know, is always like, when are you going to tell them no? When are you going to say no? When are you going to like, what, what else do you do? Um, when are you going to be, you know, when's your plate going to be filled? But, you know, to me, it's like the answer is always yes. We'll figure out a way to do it. And whether that's, you know, working until midnight, like I did last night, um, you know, or, or, you know, just, just pushing through everything to get it done. Um, that's just my mentality. And it, it definitely came from, from being there for so long. I mean, that was my education started there when I was 20. Um, so, I mean, that was my, you know, uh, master course in, in television and marketing and, and the way they do things. And, you know, I'll always be grateful for the way I was taught and to, you know, uh, as a, just a grown up, like to, to own responsibility for things that, you know, maybe aren't your fault sometimes, but, um, as John Laurinaitis once said, you know, I, I sometimes you have to eat, um, uh, shit. And, 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 you know, <laughs> How do I put you, this? You, you just, you, right. I was trying to PG it up and uh, I couldn't, um, you know, and you just, you just deal with it. I mean, I, I got a promo cut on me the other day about something that happened in North Carolina that I had nothing to do with. And I just listened and, and okay, all right, well, we'll fix it and we'll get it right next time. And, and you move on and you try to do better the next time. Yeah. Um, speaking of your wife, are you surprised at where you're at are you surprised at the fact that you are so married into professional wrestling and when I say so married into professional wrestling I mean literally like not only in your professional life are you now handling every aspect of a professional wrestling company but your family is wrestling wrestling is everything are are, are you surprised that that's the way that, that things went in, and that's where we're at in 2018 I think so. She had an interview this morning um, and we were driving home from the gym and just to hear someone else talking about like wrestling and and that being their life and starting out and going and training and wrestling. Like it was a little surreal to me to think like, okay, this is, you know, I'm 38 now um, and and this is the life that we've chosen. And then you're so far deep into it that not like you couldn't get another thing. Like I've had opportunities or or the possibilities of opportunities to, to go and, do what I do for call it a quote unquote normal company. But, uh, you know, to me, like this is just, you know, and and you and I have known each other for so long that I don't think I ever hated wrestling, but I think a lot of times I hated some situations that I was in. Um, and now I get to sort of start over and go to independent wrestling shows with Sanjay and, and learn that side of wrestling that I didn't really get to learn or, or look at or appreciate, um, for so many years because I was coddled, uh, in a, in a billion dollar company. Yeah, do you kind of, when did you start to realize that, that, you know, you get over your kind, I don't want to say bitterness, like, you know, I mean, that, that sort of normal no, thing. No, it's a good question. I think, I mean, a good, good way to phrase it, I think, in the, for a while, that that was probably the, the emotion that I felt towards them. Yeah, like, when did you kind of get past your bitterness and move on to like, you know what, I'm pretty grateful for the lessons that I've learned. And it's time for me to acknowledge that for a lot of years, I was coddled, the word you just used. I think that, you know, a lot of people never realize that they were coddled and they don't realize the good things that came out of an experience that might not be happening anymore. And they just kind of stay in that space of like, well, they screwed me over and blah, blah, blah. (laughs) You know, to come out on the other side, when did you kind of figure out that you were both coddled and that you had been given a lot of knowledge that maybe at the time you didn't realize? I think through my wife's eyes, like uh, last year and, and watching everything that she did um, and, and seeing her get to compete at all in in front of the largest crowd she ever competed in front of and to see her excitement 
over that um, to get the call to do Mae Young to sitting down and her and I having a conversation about, okay, should I go to Ring of Honor? Should I do this? Should I like, like through her excitement, like it made me kind of like go, you know what? Like it was a really long time ago that I was like trying to, you know, it was almost so easy for me to, to get to where I got to like in hindsight because I was so young and it didn't take me years and years um, to get there. Um, so, so watching her do it last year and everything she did, I think to me was like the, the, um, it's really hard to do this. Like, it's really hard to get to the level that one, I got to, and two, that I feel already still, still at in, in, you know, in getting to live a great life and, and all of those things that come with it. But I think that we, um, you know, just watching her level of excitement, um, over the last year, and then to realize that, um, uh, that place isn't the end all be all of there's other things out there that there's people doing amazing things that we can do amazing things too. Um, and, and you don't have to be associated with that company. Like there are opportunities going forward for, for growth in this space. And I would also think that watching your wife show up in the May Young classic, maybe had you realized that not only are there other things, but you know, the, the world, even within the WWE, has become much bigger than it was when you left. I don't think that you know the company that you left would have done something like the Mae Young Classic, where they brought in people like your wife who were working in other companies. You know, I, I think that that's the that's the evolution of WWE uh, as well. Well, yeah, and you look at all the people that were in that tournament, and, and if I would have have still been there, and I would have seen these people in the tournament, okay. 32 people. Okay. Mercedes Martinez. Who's that? But because I have been outside of there for so long and I know who Mercedes is and I have gotten to see her wrestle in Chicago for shimmer and rise and have gotten to talk to her. Like that's really cool that they brought in someone like Mercedes who has the background that she's had and has been competing for so long. But had I been in that bubble and, and never left that bubble, I would have looked at these 32 girls and gone, okay, I don't know any of them, uh, you know, th their careers don't mean anything, but now I get to appreciate so much more, um, of what these people have gone through in order to get to where they're trying to get to that. It, it, it's a lot cooler for me. So it's really, I mean, it's pretty interesting because it sounds like with the evolution of impact and the fact that you guys are now partnering with so many independent companies and you guys are sending your talent all over the country and, you know, taping TV, and Twitch TV shows all over the country at all these different independent shows that you've actually, through the experience of seeing the shows, kind of been rejuvenated as a fan. For sure. And, and that goes without question. Like the other day I was watching something and I sent a message to Sanjay. I was like, yo, this dude Bandino is amazing. And he's like, what are you watching? <laughs> I was like, I caught myself like looking at YouTube videos of this guy who I found <laughs> compelling <laughs> um, and, and even just talking about like different people that we see, like there's dudes at wrestle pro, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it Dan Moff? Is that Dan Moff? Yeah. 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 I, I the forget. Boricua beast, yeah, Dan Moff. He's amazing. Yeah, amazing. And, and I got to go to a wrestle pro show and, and, and talk to Pat Buck and I'm going to California on Friday to do, um, Twitch and one night only with big time wrestling. And, and not only do I get to go and see these things, but I, I talk to the promoters daily. And I think that a lot of them are kind of taken aback with like how quickly I get things done for them. If they need like images of talent or they need anything, like I'm always quick to email back or talk to them back. And it's always like, Oh, what a, what a like, what a great working relationship we're all developing here. And I think like, um, it, uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to talk to all these people and, and know who they are. And, you know, be able to work with all these different promoters and companies and, and new talent. Um, but there's a dude named Cam Carter who's working in the Carolinas, who I think is really good. Um, so it's just, you know, it's really cool to be able to talk to these guys. And then to have someone like I remember the first time I called Idris Abraham, like Scott DeMore called me a few hours later. And he's like, dude, he freaked out that you called him. And I forget sometimes So like <laughs> I have been doing this for a long time. And I'm like, Idris, I need this, this and this. And give it to me. You know what I mean? It's just like. I, I'm always in work mode, not in like the, you know, I, I've spent a long time in this business mode. Right. You're more, you know, what am I doing today? What are we doing? What do we have to do to get to this place tomorrow as opposed to, hey, let's not forget. Let's not forget my history. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Like I don't even, it never even comes into to my brain space. So like when you say like rendering talent, 
um, hi, Matt Fortune's call me line. Send a voicemail. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> when uh, you say wrangling talent, like I have no problem like being a TV and being like, okay, I need to go grab uh, so and so, and we got to go shoot this stuff like right now because I've only got you guys for for two days, and then I'm not going to see you for for three weeks. Right. I mean, it's also cool uh, on a couple of levels. You know, you bring up Pat Buck, and I love watching the WrestlePro Impact Wrestling partnership just because I've been friends with Pat Buck as well for so long. So watching, you know, uh, Kevin Matthews and Fala Ba and all these guys. Uh, Fala is a star, man. Isn't he that incredible? He's a star. I love him. Yeah. I love him. Watching all these guys get the opportunity, but then also seeing Impact be able to develop into a promotion that can use – talent from around the world right because of the new business model so pentagon can be a big star in impact and sammy callahan can be a big star in impact without having to convince anybody to sign to deals that are unfair to people or or whatever you just end up in a promotion and what i think is going to be eventually we're going to get there the future of wrestling outside of the wwe which is watching all this incredible talent that's spread out across the independents all kind of come together, you know, and, it's and such I, a I think catch that, 22 that yeah. that's, that's where like that part right there, because it's like, okay, we're putting tickets on sale for a show. Okay. I wish that you could only see Pentagon or Phoenix <laughs> uh, or Sammy at impact. Sure. That would make it a little bit easier. And, and that's why WWE gets to do what they do because they have that luxury, but it's so hard to, you know, okay, well, they were just working for MLW last week, so they were just in New York, and, and that's that's where it gets a little tricky. So is that, does that become about matchmaking? Like, okay, well, is there a match that we can offer that maybe you wouldn't see in an MLW or, you know, wherever they're going to be? I think you have to do that, right? Like, yeah. you have to get outside the box. Like, we're going to be at Culture Clash uh, in April over the big uh, WrestleMania weekend, obviously, will be Thursday uh, at Culture Clash with uh, House of Glory, and it's just uh, putting together those that card and, and those matches that people are going to go, oh, like I have to see that. We got um, very fortunate last year with Impact versus Lucha Underground um, because people thought that that was really cool, and 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 it delivered in such a big way. Um, I think that was one of the best shows of the year, and I, to me, that's where I point to the the birth, so to speak, of the of what Santana and Ortiz have been able to do, in my opinion, is have the best tag team uh, of the year and what they've accomplished and where they've gone. It's been it's been incredible to watch those kids. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, you know, as a guy who is uh, so keen on digital content, you'd be a good quite person to ask this. You know, TV ratings are, I feel like, something that's talked about amongst fans and we'll call them internet analysts way more than actual people in wrestling these days and you know the conversation came up with uh the impact ratings going down after you change time slots i feel like every tuesday people are talking about you know whether raw ratings are up or down or whatever and what this means for business but you see in both companies in impact and in wwe and in every wrestling company really where there's any kind of criticism for TV ratings, you see all these other marks of a healthy company in various different avenues, whether it's internet, whether it's ticket sales, whether it's whatever. Um, as a guy who's got his hands on impact as much as you do, what do TV ratings mean in 2018? How much do they mean? How important are they? Okay, so I have to say this with a caveat. Mm -hmm. I am the first person that knows the rating for our overnight, and I send it to everybody on Friday at exactly 445 when it comes out on Show Buzz Daily, and I am refreshing until they put the top 150 out. Um, and the Thanksgiving numbers were delayed until today, and uh, I was on there at 830 waiting for the numbers, <laughs> and we did a 124 on Thanksgiving, which is up from the previous week. Um, That's great. But with that said, yeah, with that, but next week we'll do a 102. Like it's so you can't predict that number. And for us, it's like because it's that number, right? Like that's like if two people don't watch the show that week, it's going to affect it, you know, enormously. So with that caveat being said, uh, it's not that important, right? Because mm -hmm. the plus three, the plus five, the plus seven – um, the president of Pop TV, Brad Schwartz, said that he wish that he can get a plus 30 
uh, which they don't obviously do. Um, <laughs> but if you can look at the plus seven numbers and the weekend numbers, especially for a show that's on Thursday, um, that speaks more to who's watching the show, obviously, than your overnights. But I think we're just stuck in that weird, like, Monday Night Wars world where the overnight was such a big deal, but it's not really. And then the most important number is the key demo. Um, you know, I know what our key demo was for Thanksgiving, and I'm not going to say it because it was low. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that number was was disappointing and lower than than normally where we are. We're normally right around like point eight to point seven, um, and, and that's okay. You don't want to get over one point, whatever. Um, but that's the most important number, that key demo. And so the overnight's not a huge deal, but we all look for it. We all wait for it. We all discuss it. We all debate it. When we got up over 500,000 earlier this year, um, you know, the debate was raging on as to how we did it. And, and, and again, look, be, being so close to these things now, I know that um, uh, right now, you know, the numbers aren't going to be great. But um, uh, March and April and May, the numbers are going to be super inflated because it's WrestleMania season. And the numbers will be inflated across the board for all wrestling and not only TV ratings, but but for digital numbers like April and May uh, are going to amaze people. Like if you came on board in April and May, you go, oh, my God, look at how great this is. What an uptick. And then the summer comes around. You're like, oh, wait, what what's happening? What's going on? You, you have to look at it like it's a roller coaster. Those months are going to be up, and then the summer months are going to go down. Now, how much of an indicator is it for business in general? Like, do you sit there and go, okay, well, this time last year we were at this number, which means we should be at that number. Is it as much of an indicator? Because I think, like you said, the Monday Night Wars, that's when TV, TV ratings didn't even matter before the Monday Night Wars. Nobody really talked about them. But it was the Monday Night Wars when it was like, since these two shows are on at the same time, that was your one numerical statistic that could say, well, this show did better than that show on this night. But in 2018, when stuff is not running head to head, and there's also so many other ways to watch a show, how, how much of an indicator of the, how the business is doing are TV ratings? I don't think that they are at all because you have to then look at – if you're going to look at TV ratings, um, then you still have to look at, okay, well, what about YouTube? And, and we post our clips um, very close to when they air on the show. Mm -hmm. Whether you agree with that philosophy or not, uh, that's just the method that has been taking place over the last number of months. So you know, if you're watching it on YouTube or you know you're going to get to see it um, you know, shortly thereafter it airs um, and then the next day with the clips and then uh, you can watch it on – um, uh, all the different platforms, uh, from Pluto TV to Hulu to, uh, we're not on Netflix. Um, but there's just so many different ways to see impact, uh, global wrestling network, uh, that it's so hard to say, you know, uh, I only watch it on TV or only watch it here. It's, it's just, it's impossible to, to make that TV number mean as much as it used to, because there are, to your point, so many ways to watch this show. Um, that you, it's not, it's not even an, uh, a fair balance, really. When you watch guys, because you've been in in Impact for a long time now, when you see you were there, when there are so many guys now, this new crop or the current crop of WWE guys, there's more guys than ever, especially in that top tier, that spent a good amount of time in Impact and what was TNA at the time. When you see guys uh, prosper that you watched over in TNA or Impact, whatever you want to say. Do you get frustrated at the fact that they weren't capitalized on as well as they could have been uh, when you saw them, or do you just get kind of happy for their success? I think it's um, being happy for their success. I mean, how can you not be happy for someone like AJ Styles? Yeah. And, and I see AJ from time to time at the airport, and, and we always uh, you know, spend a few minutes talking to each other. Um, EY is another great dude who, when I lived in Nashville, um, was just super cool and, and, and very friendly and invited me to Fred's games. I mean, these were, these were guys that have been around for a long time. Samoa Joe, um, who, who were always nice to me and then they go off and they, and they're there now and they're having the success that they're having. But it's like, even when you look, I mean, someone on a smaller scale who, who I don't think works there anymore, uh, Mahabali Shira, when the decision was made for him not to get re-signed to impact, I was like, okay, he's going to go to NXT. And, and he may become a big success there, but we, he's going, you know what I mean? Like we can't keep him, but there's a chance that he goes out and becomes a star at WWE. That didn't work out for, for sure the way he might've wanted it to, but there are those guys that like, you know, 
while you would want to keep them in a perfect world within, with a bankroll of, of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you would want to keep everybody. But it's not a perfect world, and, and people go. Um, you know, I, I won't get into details as to why my wife left Impact, but she wanted to stay. She, she, she would have stayed. Um, she liked it there. But the opportunity to go to Ring of Honor and, and do more w- was there for her, and she went with that. And, and now she loves Ring of Honor, and that's her home. But, you know, there was there was nothing about Impact that she didn't like that she was saying, I want to go. I don't want to be here anymore. How quick did you know that the broken Matt Hardy thing was going to be a success? Because I would say certainly of that era of Impact, if not, you know, the last decade, that was the broken Matt Hardy was one of, if not the breakout moments for the company. Uh, how How quickly... Did you know this isn't just some weird thing? We are really on to something that, that has the potential to catch fire. When Matt Hardy called me on Thanksgiving and told me about this. Uh-huh. So it, it hadn't happened yet. It was going to happen. What year was that, Ash? Do you remember? When the Broken Brilliant stuff. 16, right? I think he called me. It was Thanksgiving Day. And he said, I just got done having Thanksgiving with Jeff. Listen to this idea. And he tells me the whole, I mean, literally, Sam, he tells me everything, beginning to end. We're going to have a match in the woods. We're going to put a ring in the woods. We're going to do this. We're going to do, and I said, Matt, you're nuts, <laughs> but this sounds amazing. Uh-huh. And if you guys can pull this off, and he told me, he goes, I'm going to have amnesia, and I'm going to do this with my hair, and think about the character from uh, what, Johnny Depp in the haircut movie. Edward um, Scissorhands. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, uh, the, the, the tween, Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. Yeah. Sweeney Todd, yeah. And, and he's telling me all about this. And and I hung up after like an hour on the phone with him. And I started telling Ashley, like, this is what he wants to do. This is this is his plan. And 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 it's it's he's broken. And like, I thought about it all night. And it was brilliant. And then he executed it. And it was, I mean... It was amazing, and the, the broken universe is something that was that was so unique on the impact, um, and so cool that uh, you know, amazing. Just, just I can't say enough good things about that. And it was all Matt's brainchild. So great when 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 you hear stuff like that. Okay, so we've got we've got uh, we love Falaba, we love LAX, <laughs> we love uh, Phoenix and Pentagon. Who are the guys that are in Impact now that you want to see? the company turn into next level stars like who are the who are the guys that you really are are just there's something about them that in your gut you're like that's one of my guys i love that dude so there's these three kids they're called the rascals Mm -hmm. um wentz and and, uh, zach wentz desmond xavier and trey miguel uh they have you seen have you watched any of this their stuff yet yeah sure so they, they do like uh, the spoof on the 70s show right? where the kids are sitting around and the, and the, and the camera's kind of in the middle spinning around uh, as, they're, as they're getting high. Right. And I, I watched that vignette probably 20 times just <laughs> on my couch at night and, and pause the TV and show my wife. And she was like, what's this? Um, and, and it's um, it, I think that we have to explore things like that and go down that road to to differentiate ourselves from anybody else and it's like three dudes sitting around i don't smoke weed i never got into it but kids do (laughs) and um i I thought that um i mean it's going to be legal everywhere anyway soon right but i thought that um and and those guys can go in the ring and and they're so receptive and they're so cool and, and they're so like i sent them a graphic the other day and they all like freaked out with the emojis of like fire and how cool is this and, and that to me makes me happy um to see guys get excited about stuff and, and working on t-shirts for them and i think that those three if i were buying stock in people it, it would be uh, uh des and trey and, and uh Lance for sure i love that uh from a commentator's perspective you've worked with i mean so many different people over the last 15 years or however long it's been um how what is it like to work with Don Callis? You know, it's funny because Don is in the position that he's in, right? He's a, a EVP mm-hmm. um, in the company. So if I were to like, I, like I give my my honest opinion is that I think Don and I are very good together, and and that's not with Don being in the position that he's in. That's my 
like legitimate opinion. If Don were just my color commentator partner, I would say the same exact thing. Um, I, and I told him this in Vegas when we were just there, took our headsets off, and I said that was the best show we've ever called. And people don't understand with Impact is that we're it's a live event first, and TV tapings are second. So when they build that show. Um, that night, it's, okay, what's the best live event we can put together? Now, we're filming four episodes, so on one night, I may call um, four different episodes and four different segments, uh, you know, like 1847, and then we're going to jump to 1846, then we're going to go back to 47, now wow. we're going to do 50, now we're going to do a match from uh, for 49. So I have to keep up with what show we're on, what match we're in, what segment we're in, to know what I can talk about, what we haven't seen yet. Wow. Um, and... and Don uh, does a great job of knowing where we are, what we're doing, what segment we're in, what show we're in. Um, you know, so I'm bouncing around between 18 different formats and and all sorts of different things. So it's it's stressful, um, but it's fun. And 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 I think Don and I we have similar personalities. And that, well, um, I mean, Don is super elitist. I think that many people may say I'm an elitist. <laughs> um, so, so, and, and we both uh, germaphobes and. If the guys come close to our table, we both kind of like, like, where's the Purell? Um, so, so we're very similar in those respects. And I think that, um, you know, now we've only gotten better because he knows when I'm going to talk. I know when he's going to talk. That's that's kind of like 40 percent of having a color commentator that you work well with is knowing when they're going to get in and knowing when they're going to get out. I know what moves he wants to call, what names of moves he wants to call. I know when he wants to talk. And, and that's sort of like once you figure that part out. The rest is sort of easy. It also seems like with somebody like him who is so personality heavy that it would make your job of defining yourself as the play-by-play man way easier. And, yeah, and I, I do. I get to just call action. I get to um, uh, you know do what I ha- have been trained to do uh, for for so many years and and just do my job uh, and. And at Impact, it's so much more important because we've got to get these kids over. You know, people don't know who they are. They're not John Cena or Roman Reigns or, or Seth Rollins. You know, we've got to get these guys over. Uh, and it's, that's our job. Um, so it's a little bit harder than it was up there because those guys were over. You call an RKO and, and everyone cheers for Randy Orton. Um, so it's, it's, it's different in that respect. If we've got to explain who these characters are and get them over to an audience. It blows my mind that you guys are doing live commentary, but you're shooting it almost like a film in the sense that the story is all out of order. So you kind of have to figure out where the story is and be able to piece it together. Why do you, why do you do, why do you bother doing the commentary live? Like if it's, if you're not going to do the matches in order, why wouldn't you save yourself the headache and just you and Don get together and do the commentary on tape? Hey, there's a few reasons. Um, one is that uh, neither Don or I live in Nashville. Mm. Um, and, and because I'm not there anymore, I think that they've they've kind of said, hey, let's let's do it at, at TV and, and help these guys out so they don't have to be away from their families. Any, I mean, it, th- those are the kind of decisions that are made in this company, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, one, they, they, they didn't hold a a grudge or resentment towards me not being in Nashville anymore. Um, you know, I'm five hours down the road. So if I need to go there, I can, but they know that's not a super easy trip to make. Um, so, so we do everything there and it helps both Don and I out. Um, so that's why I don't mind when the show starts with the main event from 1850. And then I've got to call four other shows. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I get what they're doing to help us. So, so I do my best to make sure I know where we are, uh, at any given point in the show. Do you end up getting hungry for those weekends, though? Like, because you guys tape, you know, you'll do, when I saw you, you're doing Bound for Glory, and then I think two nights of TV tapings. But you're, you're, when you are taping shows, it becomes so intensive in the sense that, like you said earlier, you've got two or three days with all the talent, and you just have to get everything done, and there's no choice in the matter. Everybody's jumping in head first. You're all underwater for the next three days. And when you come out of it, you're going to have six to eight weeks worth of TV. Do you end up going like, I'm sure at the end of those weekends you're exhausted, but how long is it before you're going, man, you know, I'm kind of ready to tape another set of shows? Um, well, for me it's different because we, we do the monthly Twitch and the one night only. So, so I'm, you know, I'm home and then yeah, I just got home from Vegas and then I leave again Friday morning. So it's like, you know, we're still out there. It's just we're not doing TV as much. Then when I get home from 
um, California, then it's homecoming, and then we're in Mexico a couple of days after that. So, I mean, it, it, it's probably two weekends a month. So it, it's a good balance. You know, you're okay. by the time you're to your point, though, you you know, you are ready to get that out well, when you're home because that's just like the, the mentality of all of us is you get cabin fever after too long. What do you? As my wife says, "Oh yeah, I get cabin fever." <laughs> well, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like you both have been in the wrestling business for so long. That's one of those things where when you spend too much time together, it's almost like I'm not used to being around another person in the same closed space for this many days in a row. I- I'm a good the first night guy. Like I love the first night um, and getting to whatever town we're in, and I think I get like overwhelmed with excitement and energy. And end up staying up too late and, and, and hanging out with everybody too long. Um, and then I want to go home immediately. <laughs> because I never did that the first night. I just don't know a good balance. Um, <laughs> if it's first and last night. In the middle, I'm kind of like, oh, man. Right. Get out of here. Right. Last night, you're celebrating because there's no tomorrow. We're all good. Exactly. That and makes then sense. we were on Red Eyes coming home from Vegas. So that was just, we were at the airport like children just waiting to get on planes to go home. So. Right. That makes sense. What do you realistically... What are your goals slash hopes for impact in 2019? What do you want to see happen? And realistically, you know, how, how plausible is it? Well, I think when you look at 18 and you look at our pay-per-views, like between Redemption, Slammiversary, and BFG, like I think we had three of the best pay-per-views of any wrestling company um, uh, of the year, especially um, Slammiversary. It was quickly acclaimed. Um, so I, I think that having great pay-per-views is, is a good start. And even like to even talk about a traditional pay-per-view in 2019, I don't think I would have thought that we would be having this conversation um, a couple years ago. But through things like Fight TV and uh, different streaming services, pay-per-views can still be a thing and, and big shows can be a thing. And I just think that, you know, our calendar is booked now until April. So everyone knows where we're going to be through April. I think that the stigma or the the worry that impacts going to go out of business um I, I think can be put to, to rest for for the next you know five to seven years and i don't know if anyone has been able to say that about this company in a long time but i think that you know a, the direction uh, of 18 was to let's figure this thing out and 19 is okay figure it out and and let's really get some 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 power behind this and i mm-hmm. think that's where we are going into 19 so you know, there's things that are happening um, that, that are exciting, and you know, you just have to see if those things come to fruition, and then it's you know, doing the work once we once we get there. It, how many inst- were there any times, and how many times were there when you realistically thought, I really think this company is going to go out of business. I think I'm not going to have a gig anymore. This is we're, there's no way because you know, when as an outsider, you read along with everything that's going on, and and since you got there, however many years ago. There's been, you know, many, many times when everybody's like, I don't know, it's not looking good, it's looking bad, this is getting sold. You've gone through a ton of different owners and different people running the company. Uh, how many times and what was the closest time you felt to we're in danger here, this is it? Well, uh, I think I'm more pessimistic uh, than optimistic about things a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um so, so there was a few times where I thought, okay, the, the, this is there's just no way. It's just it can't continue. Uh, yeah, this is when we were, you know, everyone was in Nashville and we were at Common Station, and uh, you know, we switched offices. We went from the big office down to the basement. Um, we then went to the warehouse to work for a little while. Um, <laughs> I just a lot of times, but you know, I can say this as an employee of the company, I've never been paid late. And I've never not been paid on time and I've never not been paid my full salary. So it's so hard for me to say, I think, and I thought, and I was worried about this. And then to, to, you know, so it's kind of like, I I don't want to be disrespectful to those people who um, made sure that on the first and 15th, that, that my money was in my bank account. Um, You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, did did I ever think it was going to end? Yeah. A a few times. Um, But then I think back to to those years in WWE where, you know, we did campaigns like tighten the belt and and expense reports were looked at and you couldn't spend a lot of money on the road. And and, and going through probably wasn't um, close to shutting the company down. But, you know, I think that Impact uh, uh, or TNA, as it were, then probably came close, closer than I knew a couple of times. Um, 
Uh, but there was always TV and there was always, uh, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And you're, you're like you said, your check always cash. So like, at the end of the day, that's your only indication, right? And, and right. And like it wasn't like anybody called me and said, hey, uh, you know, this is going to happen. The, you know, we're all worried. Like it was always that speculation, right? That online speculation that this was going to happen or, or spike dropped them and now impacts dead, whatever the case may be. Um, it always, uh, I don't want to say the little engine that could because we passed that, but always found a way to survive. Now that you're, you've got more of an eye on the talent that's out there, is there any talent that you look at and is kind of like, I, I, I would love for that person to be an impact? There's a few people on these uh, Twitch shows or one night only shows that I thought, um, man, these guys deserve a contract. Uh, there was a show in Detroit uh, Scott Demore and I called it, and, and uh, the first I can't remember any of the guys that were in it at this point. But the first match, I thought every one of them could have been on our roster tomorrow. Like mm-hmm. they were that good. Um, Cam Carter, who I mentioned earlier in the Carolinas, um, oh good girl, Sam. We got a puppy, and every time she goes to the bathroom where she's supposed to go, we have to praise her. So I have to oh. stop what I'm doing and tell her how great she did. Good girl. Good, job, good girl. Um, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, so, so so people like that, um, it, it, I'm trying to think if there's any female wrestlers out there that we've talked about lately that um, should get looks. Um, my wife's looking at me like, oh, who's he going to say? Who's, he, who's, <laughs> even keep, who's he been keeping an eye on? Yeah, who's, this could get you in trouble. Out there? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, honestly, I think that uh, Rachel Bostic, uh, speaking of girls, she um, is someone who I think, and she got an opportunity to impact when we were in Las Vegas, and I think that she she hit the ball to the park. She's um, been doing this for a while now. Uh, she's from Pittsburgh. I think that she's someone to, to keep an eye on. Well, Josh Matthews, I love seeing you uh, grow and develop and uh, evolve as a performer and as a worker and as a human being, and it seems like you're in a pretty wonderful space in your life right now, so congratulations on everything, man. Yeah, thanks, buddy. We're, when will I uh, see you again? Are you coming to uh, beautiful Ohio anytime soon? Uh, I don't know, but I feel like uh, since I didn't see you the entire time you were in Nashville... I should try to I should try to at least come and visit you in Ohio. Well, I mean, we're here now. Like I, you know, our house is done. We move in this week and then uh but I'll be in Nashville in January, so I don't, you know, maybe uh maybe a trip to Nashville. Yeah, it wouldn't be it, it it's it wouldn't be a bad idea. It I mean, and I I I meant to get out there like so many times and it was just like, yeah, next time, you know how it is. Next time, next time, but I enjoyed yeah, seeing yeah. you when you were in New York and I was telling Jess, that was the first time we had actually physically seen each other in year a couple of years, I think. And I, I think since the last time I was in New York, right? Probably. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it was it was the funniest thing because it was like that old cliche. Like I felt like it had been two weeks. Like I was like, this is just this is exactly how it's always been. So uh, we just but, pick up where you where you left off. Right? Ex- exactly, exactly. Um, thanks a lot, man, and thanks for doing the show. Of course, uh, my pleasure. Let's not uh, have so long in between when we when we do this. Absolutely.